Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's amazing to see this uh, audience to be so packed. Uh, I think it's just crazy to see how, how much the GraphQL space is growing. And uh, I just talked to a few people, and it seems like most of you are fairly new to GraphQL. Um, so I want, I'm giving my best today to give you as much of an introduction to how you would build your own GraphQL servers. I'm simplifying the talk today a little bit and focus the most on the JavaScript and the Node.js Node ecosystem, since this is where most of the GraphQL action is happening right now. Um, but you can pretty much apply all of these concepts also to, to other language ecosystems. So this is going to be a practical introduction to GraphQL server development. So the majority, or not the majority, but a large extent of the talk will be actually uh, a practical demo um, that you also get a feeling for how you would actually build something with GraphQL since it provides such a nice workflow. So uh, the first part of the talk, we will get an overview of how you would build GraphQL servers um, in Node.js. And we're also going to look at, into two different ways of building GraphQL servers. One is called schema first, and the other one is called resolver first. Then we'll take a look into a new resolver first GraphQL framework called Nexus. And we're also going to explore that in an actual demo. And lastly, we take the example that we've built in this demo and connect it to a real database uh, using Prisma. All right, my name is Johannes Schickling. I'm the co founder and CEO of Prisma. If you want, you can follow me um, at Schickling also on Twitter. At Prisma, we are building the data layer for modern applications. So that means building um, tools around databases for all kinds of different workflows. So for example, we are building Prisma Client, which is an auto-generated type-safe database client library. You can think about it as a replacement for your traditional ORM. We are also working on Prisma Migrate, which is a way uh, that lets you declaratively model your database and migrate your database and also, um, soon we, we're going to launch Prisma Admin, which is a visual database management tool. So you can think about it as a modern version of PHP My Admin, if you're so famili familiar with that. Um, but uh, based on any kind of database for modern development workflows, where you can even bring your own React components to extend that environment. But let's talk about GraphQL server development. So a brief recap, and maybe this is even the, the, um, the first time for, for some of you where you learn about how a GraphQL server works on a high level. So I want to demonstrate this here um, by, through the example of actually a GraphQL query coming in, typically sent from some, some sort of front-end application, for example, from a React application. And I believe you've seen in some of the previous talks you've already seen what a GraphQL query looks like and the beautiful declarative nature. And that basically makes it super simple for your client developers, for your front-end developers to send and craft these queries. But that's the, the general perception is this puts a lot of, like, of the complexity into the backend. So how can the backend take this, this declarative query and resolve the data that feeds that query? So you basically have to um, keep a couple of components there in mind. So most GraphQL servers are actually uh, provided through an, HTTP, uh, through a traditional HTTP server. So there you could, in Node.js, for example, use Express.js or, or whatever you want. So this uh, HTTP server accepts a GraphQL query, typically via a post endpoint um, inside of uh, the, the payloads encoded as a string. So it's takes that string, extracts the GraphQL query, and feeds it into the GraphQL execution engine. And the GraphQL execution engine is kind of the implementation of the GraphQL specification. And that's kind of like the, the heart of your GraphQL server. The good news is this is what you can just use as a library. You don't have to do anything there. What you have to do is implement your schema and your resolvers. And the resolvers are basically little functions that um, the engine calls for you and returns data, retrieves data from your database, from other legacy APIs, other APIs, and um, returns that data. And the engine basically uh, invokes all of the resolver functions at the right time, um, returns the data, and builds up your response matching to your GraphQL query. And um, this 
entire workflow is basically how a GraphQL server works. And the TLDR of like how you would build a GraphQL server is actually quite simple. So step one, you have to take a GraphQL server framework in your given language that typically contains the HTTP server or the, the network server and the GraphQL execution engine. And the actual work is in defining and implementing your schema and your resolver functions. And this is what we will look into in detail today. This is basically when you hear, I have to build a GraphQL server, this is what it means to build a GraphQL server. So um, for those of you who are not yet familiar with the term of a GraphQL schema, the GraphQL schema is essentially the thing that you know, defines the structure of your GraphQL API. So you can think about it like um, the question, what could I query for? What kinds of queries can I send to my GraphQL server that I can get data for? And this structure is defined as your GraphQL schema. GraphQL out of the box provides a really nice syntax for that called GraphQL SDL, short for schema definition language. You see an example here on the right where it's essentially a way for you to express uh, a type system. So here you see the entry point type query where you can query for posts. And you also see the type definition for a post where you can query for an ID, a title, the content, etc. cetera. And uh, in, in practice, you can define your schema uh, in two ways, two ways, either in a declarative way, um, as you're seeing here on the right using GraphQL SDL, or also programmatically. So let's go all the way back to 2015. I even believe it was here in, in Paris at React Europe when GraphQL first got announced. And it got released together with a first reference implementation in JavaScript called GraphQL.js. And GraphQL.js is actually, at still today, um, probably the most commonly used GraphQL implementation. And um, let's take a look how it looked like back then, how, how you would build a GraphQL server. This was the first way of how people in the public could build a GraphQL server. So if we now want to build a GraphQL API with the, for, with the following schema, the way how we would express that using GraphQL.js, so to implement that schema here with some actual code, this is how it looked like. And that is quite verbose. But let, let's take a look at what actually is happening here. And this is also even just a simplified version where you just express basically the types. There are no, not yet the resolver functions implemented. So you have a lot of these GraphQL prefix um, classes that you instantiate, like GraphQL object type, GraphQL non-null, etc. This is basically where you have this AST-like syntax um, where you try to implement what your GraphQL schema should do. And this was the first implementation. But um, while... Uh, the, the syntax was kind of nice to think about. Um, it ended up rather becoming the foundation for tooling, but was not as practical to build your actual GraphQL APIs uh, because of its verbose API. And um, this is what fostered a whole new movement of how people build GraphQL servers in the Node.js ecosystem, uh, which is an approach called schema first. And the first tool that, um, that came out of uh, the, uh, the development of Apollo was called GraphQL Tools. And what GraphQL Tools basically allowed you to do is um, don't just take your SDL sort of as the inspiration of what you ultimately want to have, but actually treat it as your source of truth and a part of your application um, what your GraphQL schema should look like. So that basically means you're literally writing the schema of your GraphQL server using SCL. And then step two of, your, of building your GraphQL server is you just implement the resolver functions. So you split this up. And this is an approach that was um, then uh, put into production by Apollo Server. That's how you uh, right now build a GraphQL server in Java. That's how you build a GraphQL server um, using GQL gen and Go. And um, let's take a look at an actual example here. So here we have a little blogging application. So we can query for posts. A post has a title, content publish, and an author. And an author has a name, an email address, and also posts again. 
And that's the schema on the left. On the right, we see a possible implementation of that where we're retrieving that data from a database. So I think this looks fairly simple and, and kind of intuitive, but in reality, this approach comes with a bunch of problems. This is state of the art today, how most people in JavaScript build GraphQL servers. But over the last few years, we've kind of seen really um, some limitations that, um, that, that arose as you build larger schemas, as you build like medium to, to, to large applications. And I want to illustrate some of, these, uh, some of these problems now and show you an alternative approach, what I believe is um, the way how you build larger GraphQL servers. That's also the way how GitHub, Facebook, etc., cetera, builds, uh, builds GraphQL APIs. So I think one of the most common problems that people run into with this approach are inconsistencies between your schema definition in STL and your actual resolvers. So um, this is basically, if you're super diligent and if you don't make any mistakes, then you're good, then you can ignore this, but I think all as, as developers, <laughs> we're not perfect, and whatever, uh, wherever we can make a mistake, sometimes we make them. So, and here, for example, let's say in the schema and our definition, we want to expose uh, the post we can query for as feed, but in our implementation, we call the resolver posts. This doesn't match up and blows up in production. That's a very common use case that people just like do over and over again. Another very common problem is, um, like so far here, we've just seen a fairly simple and comprehensible schema, right? So all of that fits on one screen. We can kind of like wrap a head around it and, and get it. Once we have a larger schema, uh, and I think we, we've seen a schema by, by GitHub, for example, this is also a fairly small schema compared to like real world examples. Like I've seen schemas with like, um, like, uh, like five, five, di uh, five digits uh, lines of code or, or even beyond that. And um, writing all of that up in one single, uh, one single schema file um, basically is not feasible. Then you have to think about, okay, how do I split this up into modules or do I split this up by type? This is still kind of like a question that people haven't really figured out. Um, and it's a very specific question um, to how you want to lay out your code. So even if you've picked a way how you want to structure it, then you need the tools that allow you to structure that. So you need kind of like an import system. And um, with, there were all of these problems, and this is what the GraphQL ecosystem in, uh, in JavaScript has been mostly working on over the last two years. Basically more tools around the schema first approach and trying to fix the schema first approach. And um, Mikhail, who's one of the, the co-founders of the first GraphQL backend service and who's been very instrumental at creating a lot of these schema first tools, um, he kind of concluded himself, hmm, we locked ourselves in, uh, in as, a, as a GraphQL Node.js ecosystem by overusing SCL. So we basically tried to um, like do everything in SCL and everything in SCL is like actually still a string, right? So we are running into all of these problems with inconsistencies. How do we modularize things? GraphQL, SCL doesn't have an import system. Um, how do we reuse code properly? And um, the tooling and IDE support is also not quite there. But if you think about all of these problems, um, these are problems that we are now having because we're dealing with like huge strings. Um, why? There is actually a solution for that if we could just use program languages for that and kind of turn everything uh, the other way around. And that is what the resolver first approach is all about. And the resolver first approach basically says, actually, let me define my schema in, um, in my actual program language. And uh, this is how you do it in, in a lot of language ecosystems. This is how you do it like in in Scala, in, in Ruby, mostly in, in Go, in Python. And we're just now seeing that the JavaScript ecosystem also is more settling on this approach. And the idea is basically you have a language idiomatic API. You see, for example, one here on the top right for, for JavaScript, where you also have a really expressive way to express your schema definition. 
and then the SCL is auto generated. So for example, the prop let's go through the problems again, like the inconsistencies uh, between your schema definition and your uh, and your resolver implementation doesn't exist here because you have everything you have, single source of truth is your code. Or um, that we, how do you split up your code? How do you import things? Well, you're just using the uh, import module system of your program language. And I would like to show you today how you can build a GraphQL server in this resolver first approach um, in JavaScript in a new framework called Nexus that I'm super excited about and I want to show you how, how that works. So in the following, I would like to walk you through uh, a live demo where we first see a new project um, that's being set up with Nexus. We then take the minimal boilerplate and define and implement our own schema. And um, a bit later throughout this talk, we'll actually connect it to a real database. So let's dive right into it. So I hope this is somewhat big enough. Quick show of hands, like in the in the back, if you cannot read this, could you raise your hands? Uh, <laughs> sorry about you. Uh, well, I I make it big. That was a few hands, but all right. Let let's see. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, so this is roughly uh, how the how this project looks like. So let's dive into the the package JSON. Um, here we have two uh, main dependencies. We have GraphQL Yoga, which we're using as our GraphQL server framework that includes the HTTP server and the GraphQL execution engine, and Nexus, um, which is a tool that lets you create a GraphQL schema in this nice resolver first uh, approach. And um, since we're using TypeScript here, I encourage everybody to use TypeScript um, since this. Um, this is just where, where the JavaScript ecosystem is, is going, gives you type safe, you better developer experience, but there are tons of other talks about that as well. So um, that's what we're using here, and I've also set up a start script, which basically gives us auto reload for our GraphQL server. So let's dive into the um, source folder. Um, here we have our index file. In our index file, we're just uh, importing our GraphQL server. Uh, instantiating the GraphQL server, launching it on port 4000, and into that GraphQL server, we pass in our schema. So I've already um, started it here, and restart it one more time using uh, yarn start, and I can now open uh, the, the GraphQL playground where we can explore our schema. So we could now actually start writing a query, and we see here we can query for hello world. So let's see how the implementation for that actually looks like. Um, here in our schema, um, we are passing in the types. There's a bunch of other configuration, which uh, is basically just a little bit of boilerplate where, where for example, um, how uh, Nexus automatically generates your GraphQL schema, uh, the, the schema definition. So here we, we can take a look into this file. This is how our GraphQL server uh, schema currently looks like. Um, and also generates a couple of TypeScript type definitions to make it type safe. But the um, actual interesting thing about our server is in this GraphQL folder here um, where we're defining our GraphQL schema definitions. And this is basically the hello world of a resolver first GraphQL server where we are saying, okay, for our type query, we have a, um, a field hello that's of type string. And uh, if we're calling that, resolve it to hello world. And that's literally uh, what we've done here. So this is the foundation, uh, maybe your starting point to, to build something on your own. And what I would like to demonstrate now is, uh, as a next step, let's build a bit more of a real example. So here, let, uh, here's like a, a little diagram of a um, blogging application where we can query for feeds, for draft, for the feed, for some drafts and uh, look up an actual post by its ID. And the post has an ID, a title, content published, and a user has a name, email, and, and their posts. So what we're gonna do next is basically evolve our uh, Hello World to replicate that schema. To follow best practices, what I would like to do is um, 
set up one graph, one file here per GraphQL type. And I will basically uh, just replicate this here. Um, so have one for query, have one for post, and have one for uh, the user. Let me adjust this here. This one we rename to post. Um, the user we rename to user. And the last thing we have to do is here in the index file, we re-export um, all, all of these various files. So let me do that. Right, so our GraphQL server um, has picked this up now. We can take a look in the generated um, schema definition. This is how it looks like right now. Um, isn't quite there yet. We obviously need to adjust the fields. But um, this is how it looks like. Um, I would start from the post field to just match what we have here. So we have the ID, title, content, published, and author. So let's start with that. Um, let me get rid of all of this. Here we say we have a field ID of type ID. We have a field um, title of type string. We have a field uh, content of type string. And we have a field published of type Boolean. Oops. Boolean published. And we have a field uh, author of type user. And now, now you're going to see something really, really cool. So you've already seen that I get autocompletion here when I t write T and then string. I get autocompletion here. What's even cooler about Nexus is that I get auto-completion for other types that I've defined in here. So if I uh, start writing here, I see all of these different types that I can uh, now reference to. So here I can say type author user, um, and uh, it references the, the actual user type. So let me redo this here for the, for the user, um, where we have the ID, name, email, and posts. ID, name, email, and posts. Same uh, here. We say posts of type post. The only difference here is we actually want this to be a list of posts. And what's now left to do is um, do the same thing for the query. And here our feed is supposed to return uh, a list of posts. We call feed. This returns posts, and that is a list. And um, I'll first gonna now implement the resolvers before we get to these uh, other two queries that we can take this one step at a time. So what we now need to do now that we've defined the structure, and if we check out our find um, our generated schema, this actually now looks like what we want to have. Now our job is to actually return some real data. We've now defined the structure. Now let's return some real data. That's, this is what we do using these resolver functions. So here we say um, root. Uh, the second argument in these resolvers are the arguments, and the third one are the, is the context. And from the context, this is typically where we do in dependency injection for whatever we want to return from resolvers typically is made available through a context that is filled on a request level. So this is what we are doing if we're going all the way up to our uh, GraphQL uh, server. Here we instantiate, we also pass in a context where we pass in some data. And uh, this data, in this case, I've already prepared. Uh, so I've prepared a little mock database. Uh, let me briefly copy this over from a second project. So um, I will just create here a new file called data.ts, where we basically just have a bunch of hard-coded users and a bunch of hard-coded posts and their corresponding TypeScript definitions. And then we expose a type for the context um, that, that gives us access to all of this. So these are, this is the data and the type definitions. And now our job here is to pass this into the context. So here we just say um, we pass in the, the data here. Uh, oops. 
and we now need to import that. So import uh, data from data. Why is this not visible? Um, Um, ah, this is right now, uh, I went too far in here already, I briefly comment this out, otherwise uh, the, um, there we go, so, uh, otherwise, the microphone, all right, thank you. Uh, so, now we have the uh, context here. Um, we also uh, feed the right types into the um, into the system of Nexus, and what we now have available, if we come back to our query type, is in the resolver we actually see the the context um, should be uh, should be typed. That means if we are now writing context dot, we see the data popping up here, and this is what we're going to use now to implement our resolver. So here we now just return context data dot posts. Uh, we could return all posts, but in our feed, we want to uh, filter them down by just the posts that are being published. So this is basically now the resolver that returns us all the posts. Let's see that in action. We reload our GraphQL schema, can query for the feed, and now we can query for the ID, title, content and whether it's published, et voila, we see it's actually the, the real data. That was the extent of my French, by the way. Um, and uh, so, this is all great. The next step would be how can we query relations? So here this also exposes an author. Author. Um, then what's gonna happen is this will blow up because here in the, uh, in, if we're now looking into our data, um, in our post we just return the author ID but not the author itself. What that means is we need to, in the uh, post resolver here, we also need to implement a, um, a resolver for uh, the, the author. So here we have the post available. We don't have args, but we want the context. And now what we basically have is we have the post, have, on the post we have the author ID from the data um, because we've returned that in the other resolver. So what we want to do is go through, uh, basically find the uh, user where um, the user ID is the author ID. So we're just saying here, find the user with the ID uh, mapping, uh, matching the post author ID, and then we return that. And if we now uh, query this again, we get the author back. So we just now do that one last time that we can also query for the post of an author. Um, this will also blow up. Let's fix that. Um, so we go into the user uh, resolvers, implement here the post one. So here we say resolve. And notice all of this auto-completion. This makes it really nice to, uh, to implement that. Basically, you can like, just auto-complete your way through what you need to do. So here we're now say, returning the, uh, the posts um, filtered by where the post um, author ID equals to the user.id. We return that. And if we run this again, we now also get the corresponding posts. Okay, that's great. Let's um, finish up our original tasks, also implement the drafts and the post query. Um, so that's pretty simple. The drafts one is basically just what we have here already. Uh, we just turn it around. We call this one drafts and return if it's not published. And uh, let's Try that real quick. Uh, we can see here oops, that we also have drafts available. We can query for that, and now we got a different response. 
that works. And now, last but not least, we want to implement a post lookup by ID. So what we do here, in this case, it's not a list, it's a single one, but we want arguments. So we want an argument of type ID. Uh, and so we return, we implement it like this. And now in our resolver, uh, we get here in the uh, in the arcs. Uh, we actually um, should get uh, the uh, the ID property directly. So let me try that. Um, here we can now basically say context data dot uh, posts and find the post with where the post ID matches the ID from the argument. And uh, yeah, also notice the type safe nature of this. Because I've defined an arc here in the, uh, in the arc definition, I automatically get it suggested in here for, for the arguments. And all of that is made possible through, through Nexus. So let's try, this is the last part, uh, this is the last task of our, of our first task of the demo. So let's now just uh, try this one out when we now query for a post. Um, and it provide it needs an ID that we get the title, and it works. Okay, perfect. So in a few minutes, now you've seen how you can actually build your own GraphQL server from scratch with Nexus in a fully type-safe way. And like what you've seen here with like all the new tooling um, back then, three years ago, when GraphQL was first released, like this took you like many many hours. Right now, the tooling is so amazing that you can just kind of auto-complete your way through to build your GraphQL server in a fully type-safe way. So uh, let's jump back to the to the presentation and review some of the things that you've seen with uh, with Nexus. I'm super excited actually that you're the first audience to ever have seen Nexus. Nexus was uh, developed by a guy called Tim Grieser. He is the author of Knex.js, which is a popular uh, Node.js ORM, and we've been collaborating with him on that. Uh, so Nexus is a fully type-safe, resolver-first GraphQL schema framework for TypeScript and JavaScript. If you want to check out an example, you can also find it here with this link. The things that I'm most excited about Nexus is uh, its super smart and concise way of implementing your schema, even in a fully type-safe way. That means like that you saw this auto-completion for like a user type, all of that without much wiring up. If you've built a GraphQL server before, you either didn't get type safety, everything was kind of like loose, or you had to be, you had to battle like circular dependencies or, or similar things. So I think we've come to we've come really really far with this nice developer experience. Also, the full type safety. I'll, I'll speak a bit more about that, but that's available in, in TypeScript. And if you're using VS Code, you don't even have to use TypeScript. You can just use JavaScript and still get most of the benefits out of this. And since we resolve a first here, um, we can leverage the Node.js ecosystem and the, uh, and, and the, the module system to modularize our schema. And this also empowers a whole new category of like possible plugins. We're going to see a whole ecosystem popping up there around authentication, authorization, different data sources. So I'm super excited about these aspects. The schema building, let's briefly review that. We've seen uh, in action already how you would do that. You just use these object type definitions to define your type, and then you write down using this builder API your field definitions. And behind the scenes that you can reference different types uh, is using uh, string literals in, in TypeScript. So if you're interested in that, there's actually a couple of really smart things going on that the framework leverages but what you have to know about is it just works. And uh, GraphQL, so far we've just seen the uh, sort of the basics, but you can do a lot more sophisticated things. So you can, for example, uh, define your own scalar types. You can uh, define your interfaces or union types. Uh, and all of that is possible using Nexus as well. And if you want to reuse uh, some of your code in a, uh, in a more natural way, Nexus also supports mix-ins. So if you have like a group of resolvers you want to share across types uh, without using interfaces, 
uh, that's also possible. So it makes it really suitable for also large scale projects uh, while still being super simple to get started with for, for your hobby project. The thing that I'm always getting super excited about is the type safe aspect of systems. And this system really makes it uh, super simple out of the box to build, uh, build this in a type safe way. And especially for, for larger, for larger uh, deployments and, and an enterprise use case, uh, you really want that, you want to get every, every slight piece of uh, predictability that you can get. GraphQL already gets, gets you a long way there, but now that Nexus basically allows you to map, hook up TypeScript's type system to GraphQL's type system, um, is just a complete game changer in my opinion. Um, it also speeds up development throughout all stages, whether you're refactoring something and you, you're not sure about whether it breaks, or if you're in a prototyping MVP stage that you can move really fast, uh, all of that is, is, has helped you through the, the type safe aspects. And um, so throughout the resolvers, uh, throughout the models, GraphQL types, or the next. Um, all right, we're back. Uh, <clears throat> so, speaking of type safety, let's talk about type safety across your entire stack, including your database. So, um, to a lot of developers I spoke to and they have kind of like battled with this in, in the real world, they have kind of like this dream of like the end-to-end -end type safety. Like, you're, you're pushing more and more type safety into your entire stack, you want to build your front-end in a type safe way, your servers, and what you want to do is like, if you're using type safety correctly, that allows you to catch errors in build time and not in production. Um, and you want to have a type safe mapping throughout, not just within a component, not within just your front end, but between, the, between your front end and your back end, and even between your, your API server and your data sources and your databases. And um, that's what we are working on um, at, at Prisma, which allows you to access your database in a type safe way. So uh, why type safety matters, I don't think I have to explain there much, but uh, I'll briefly recap. This is one of the most common, uh, one, one of the most common causes really of downtime in, in production, because you're running into problems of like the mapping between your API and, and your database as you're chain introducing new features, refactoring something. If you don't have a super extensive uh, suite of, of integration tests, stuff will go wrong. And if you're using a type safe mapping between these layers, uh, this kind of renders most of your integration tests obsolete uh, because like a whole category of problems is, is, is just um, taken care of. And um, Prisma does that by uh, leveraging the information that your database already has. If you're using a relational database, you have a strongly typed um, schema there, and we auto-generate a type-safe client library for your program language based on your database. Um, and when you're building a GraphQL server that talks to a database, there are a couple of additional challenges that you're facing. For example, um, you have to deal with uh, the so-called n plus one query problem. Uh, GraphQL makes it super easy to traverse relations, but that puts even more of that burden on, on your side to implement all of that efficiently. And that's what Prisma solves out of the box uh, with a built-in data loader. It also makes it super simple to implement baseline CRUD functionalities, filtering, pagination, and even has, uh, has a real-time layer built in that makes it super simple for you to implement subscriptions. So how Prisma works, and we, we see it also shortly in production, uh, in, in, in action, um, is first you connect it to, uh, to your database, you, in Prisma introspects your database schema, you generate a client library uh, based on that for your program language, and then you use that library. So, and that's what we're gonna do. So we've already seen, um, Nexus in action, now we basically take that and uh, refactor it to connect to, to a real database. So let me jump back to my demo. I've uh, prepared a second starter kit here which already has uh, Prisma set up. I'll briefly walk you through the, the changes of what's different here. 
So everything is the, is the same. We, we just uh, our our resolvers are the same, just as we built them before. The only thing that's different is we have a new folder here called Prisma, where we have our data model. The data model is here represented. This is introspected based on your given database. <clears throat> Actually, also uses GraphQL SQL uh, to describe that, uh, just because it's very concise. And this data model is referenced from your Prisma YAML. Uh, here, there's basically a, a bunch of configuration. And uh, the, the most important piece of configuration here is like um, what, type, what client uh, library you want to generate for which program language. We also have a seed file here that, we are, that was already executed that puts into our, in this case, a Postgres database, puts some, um, some seed data. And once we run um, Prisma Generate, this will uh, automatically generate the Prisma client library, which we will use to, for our data access. So I, I can briefly demonstrate how that looks like if we now uh, would want to uh, start using Prisma, we now get all of these automatically suggested, automatically created um, functions where we can resolve data. For example, if you want to get uh, a specific user by their email address, and then we want to get their their posts. This is roughly the API, how it looks like to access your database um, through Prisma, and this is what we what we'll now use. So what we will do is we will uh, get rid of all of our mock data here in our data file. The only thing that we will keep is the context definition. We change that slightly to expose Prisma and expose the Prisma type. And here um, in our server entry point, we'll now expose Prisma here. OK, perfect. Um, and now we're basically ready to go to re-implement our resolvers. Um, so all we have to do now, since we have this type safe boundary already, um, that, that makes sure that we like return the right data here. So uh, what that means is actually something I haven't showed you yet, but something that's super useful in, uh, in practice is if you uh, start returning something, you actually get auto-completion for the kind of data you need to return. And that makes it basically this type safe mapping to your database now that Prisma provides. So here we're now just saying context.prisma and return the posts where um, the published field is true. So, and we're gonna do the same thing here for the drafts where the published is false, and um, then we can do the same thing for a particular post, where we are just saying, give me a post where the ID equals the ID from the arguments, and um, that was it for the query type. We don't see any compile errors here anymore. Now we're going to the post, uh, adjust that. So here we're now returning um, Give me uh, first, uh, let me get the reference point. So give me the post for the given uh, ID. And from here, we're now returning the author. And we're doing the same thing for the, for the user here. Um, so we're just re uh, retrieving the, the user uh, given a certain ID, user ID, and we are returning their posts. And um, that should actually be it. Let me open that playground and test it out. We see the same schema here again. We can query for the feed, the title, and the content. And we're getting some data back from our actual database, where we should even be able to traverse our relationships. There we go. So that was it. That basically. Um, got the data from a real database, we refactored the server that was previously static to um, expose some real data. Uh, I'm doing a little bit short on time, so there was a second part of this demo where I also wanted to show the real-time functionality, but you can also find some online materials uh, to, to look that up for yourself. Let's briefly, briefly recap what we've seen. 
So I think the most important thing that you've learned today about is these two approaches about how you can build a GraphQL server. Uh, we've seen how you would do it in a schema-first way, also some of the problems with it. And what I'm particularly excited about is uh, how you build a GraphQL server in a resolver-first way. We've seen a resolver-first framework in action um, called Nexus. And we've also seen how you can, in a type-safe way, map to your database. And again, a lot of the benefits you get out of this is to prevent uh, production downtime. Last thing, if you enjoy uh, working on tools like these, uh, we are also hiring, so feel free to check, up, uh, check out our job offerings. And uh, last shout out, we are co-organizing the GraphQL um, Con, previously known as GraphQL uh, Europe. We have some of the best speakers already pre-confirmed there. It's gonna be the biggest GraphQL conference in the world yet. And uh, it also has an open CFP. So if you're doing something interesting with GraphQL at your company, uh, feel free to also submit a talk there. And that was it. So thank you so much. And feel free to talk to me afterwards about GraphQL.